Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Quorum, so let's start. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Hakim Weatherspoon. Uh, Hakim is an associate professor at Cornell, um, where his research focuses on performance, security, and reliability in network systems. Before that, he did his uh, PhD at UC Berkeley, where he led the Ocean Store Project. Um, I'm very happy to say that he'll be spending the next year um, on his sabbatical here in Cambridge. So he'll be for six months at the lab here, and at six months uh, at the University of Cambridge. Today, he'll be telling us about his work on superclouds. So welcome, and over to you. Great, thank you. So this is kind of an introduction to, uh, to me. So I'm here for a year, like Hitesh said. Uh, I'll be a re visiting researcher here, and then also a visiting scholar at uh, University of Cambridge. So um, you know, please feel free to contact me for uh, just to talk or different things to potentially collaborate on. So this is uh, one of the projects that uh, that I've done part of my research agenda that's fairly exciting. So this is plug into the super cloud. Uh, and like Hitesh said, I guess, uh, last thing about that is that I'm an associate professor, so I had to change the slide. It used to say assistant, so that was pretty exciting. You know, after uh, six or seven years of grueling um, <laughs> uh, work, it pays off, and so you get tenured. So I'm here on sabbatical, so that's pretty exciting. So anyway, so this is also joint work with Robert Varonese, who is a uh, colleague at Cornell, and also our students, uh, Chin uh, Jia Weija Song and Ziming Shen. So the super cloud, what is it? So we'll start out, uh, it's a infrastructure as a service cloud. So this is, you know, in some sense, bare bones. You're given a raw server abstraction or raw machine um, and storage and whatnot. You're charged. Uh, nominally per hour for something like Amazon and whatnot. Uh, and then a lot of cloud providers have multiple data centers all over the world. And so here you see at the bottom, there's listed a lot of uh, cloud providers that often have a infrastructure as a service abstraction. Okay, And then Google actually is a little bit late to the game, but they're coming on uh, pretty strong. And so one issue, though, is that as soon as you start using a specific cloud, then you can get locked into their features. They may have certain features uh, that give you a performance boost, or maybe they start out cheaper uh, than some other service, or whatever the reason may be, you start using one uh, cloud provider. And then it becomes fairly difficult to move to some other cloud provider. So perhaps you're Netflix, for example, and you're running on top of Amazon, uh, and you have six to 10 petabytes of storage. It's uh, prohibitive to move that amount of storage from one provider to another, at least not for any reasonable amount of time. Uh, and once you're locked into a specific cloud, then you lose some uh, ability to uh, take advantage of other clouds who may have a lower price. Uh, I'll actually show later on in this talk that uh, there also may be some other advantages, such as uh, one one provider is not, does not cover the entire world, so you may actually be able to have better performance by being able to use multiple uh, providers. And also, if you can have multiple providers, you can actually increase your security and control or whatnot and increase availability. So by being locked into one provider, you actually lose out on some performance and perhaps lose out on some cost. So we just talked about that uh, if you have the ability to use multiple clouds, then you can reduce your cost. You can potentially reduce the latency to the end client. You can potentially have higher availability for your service. Um, you can, if you have a hybrid cloud, you can burst from your local uh, private cloud to the public cloud. You can even e increase uh, security. And what I mean by that is control. I, as a user, can now control which provider I'm using. Um, and so you can increase the security uh, from that uh, perspective. So there's quite a few benefits uh, of having the ability to use multiple cloud interchangeably. Now, there's some difficulty if you want to actually do that. And I forgot to say that if anybody has any questions as we go on, 
you know, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand and ask, uh, and we could have more of a conversation. But so, in any case, there's some difficulty if you want to actually use multiple clouds. Uh, number one, there's not actually a uniform image format. There's uh, you know, different types of virtual machine uh, hypervisor formats. Uh, there's different features and whatnot that make it difficult. There's no standard that would allow you to migrate from cloud A to cloud B. So you need some way to massage that. Uh, and then how do you actually scale across clouds anyways? There's a cost, um, you know, migrating bytes. So for some stores, often you're charged per request and per byte uh, going in and out of the cloud. So how do you actually balance all that? And how do you even enable that to begin with? And this shows some examples. Amazon uses KV, uh, Zen, excuse me. HP Cloud uses KVM. And uh, Azure here would use Hyper-V. So these are different formats that we would need to somehow use. A few years back, uh, my, my uh, research group with the student, Dan Williams, and in collaboration with IBM, Hani Jamshum, created a solution that would enable a multi-cloud multi deployment. Uh, now it's called Zen Blanket. And so the way that Zen works is actually nested virtualization, kind of like Turtles done in IBM, uh, or IBM uh, done 40 years ago. Uh, nested virtualization is not actually new. But the difference here is that you have uh, some uh, different, excuse me, some different uh, hypervisors for different first layer providers. And they're quite different. So the key here is that I can't touch or control those. So there's a, I'm going to put a dotted line here. So there's a dotted line here. The provider controls those. I can't do anything about that. Okay? I can't modify that at all. And so, but what I can do is I can start up my instance. I can start up my virtual machine or uh, guest instance. And normally what you would do is you would start an operating system. You would start Windows. You would start... Um, Linux, you would start some operating system within your guest. So instead of doing that, what Zen Blanket does is we start a, another hypervisor. So uh, this, like I said, this is nested virtualization. And the way that this works is that we have what we call blanket drivers that essentially uh, enable us to massage I.O. so that it works on top of Zen or KVM or Hyper-V or VMware or whatever the underlying system may be. Okay, so we have uh, some I.O. that is here in this domain zero, this administrative domain, and so everything goes through that. And so that's how we're able to actually create kind of a, this little shim layer and have it work on top of uh, different underlying hypervisors. And so now, one of the key takeaways here is that we, as a user, control everything in this guest VM. So we, as a user, control the, uh, the hypervisor. And uh, all the I.O. goes through the hypervisor. So we, as a user, now control um, the I.O. for storage, uh, the I.O. for networking and whatnot. And so we can actually create uh, and control layer two, do layer, what's called uh, layer three and layer two uh, encapsulation, okay? And so then we can start up second layer virtual machines uh, instances, and now uh, we can control these second layer virtual machine instances. So within those, you would then start Linux or Windows or whatnot. And since we control all the I.O., we can move all the virtual machines, uh, the VM pages, uh, for one instance to some other a physical machine, okay? And so that's how, essentially how we're going to enable migration from one provider to another is we control everything within this instance, and so we can move everything uh, that's encapsulated in this container, if you will, somewhere else, okay? So this is, in essence, how we're going to get this super cloud to work. And not only that, but we can make, uh, on top of this, within this abstraction, uh, we can make everything look uniform. So we now can uh, get this to run on top of uh, Amazon. We can get it to run on top of HP. We can get it to run on top of Google, on Azure, VMware. Uh, and everything looks like it's Zen, like a Zen environment. Okay? So it's a very uniform, homogenous environment. 
you as a user control uh, everything on top, but you as a user don't actually control the underlying uh, hypervisor. But you don't need to do that. Have to be extended for things like containers. <coughs> uh, so this is a form of container, but you're talking like Docker type of containers and whatnot. Yeah, like Linux containers, where it's more like it's more like native. Yeah. So of. yeah. So uh, so Eno asks, does this have to be extended for containers? So the the key is that this is an infrastructure as a service abstraction. So you're given the raw machine, and so if you have Linux containers or whatnot, you would just start um, a Linux OS in there, and then you'd have Linux containers. So, you know, this is the, in some sense, this is the lowest level. You have raw compute and raw storage, raw I.O. And you can build up everything from there. So you can build up a platform as a service and a service as a service and all these buzzwords that you hear uh, with this abstraction. Okay? Any other question before we move on? Can you run a Zen blanket in W? Uh, theoretically, yes. So theoretically, you could do this, and this is what Turtle showed is, and that's why it was called Turtles, is you know, what's holding up the universe. A turtle is holding up a turtle, and it was turtles all the way down. So theoretically, yes. Um, in practice, uh, no, not right now. There's things, so with the extended page tables and whatnot, there's only so many uh, levels that you can do that. So there's certain things, and decisions that we have made as well that limit uh, multiple nestings. Uh, so in theory, yes, you should be able to do that. In practice, um, it's not so easy, and we haven't tried doing three times. <laughs> but you can imagine you may want to, especially if you have a super cloud service. So now I have some service as opposed to a library, and you know now somebody may want to do it again for some reason. That now all of a sudden you may want to have a third nesting. So just two. I'm kind of interested in uh, how much of this is kind of device driver specific, or how much of it is the enlightenment specific, or um, yeah. and, and this kind of only addresses the the difference in the hypervisors between the cloud. It doesn't deal with all of the difference in, in other aspects between yeah. everything else in the cloud. So let me answer. Both those questions. It turned out to be mostly, you know, the the I/O. So the um, you know the difference in how you uh, whether you have you know full virtualization or pair virtualization, you know. So if you have uh, idealized drivers or not, it turns out that that was one of the biggest differences to get this to work. Now, as far as some of the other aspects, you know, some of the storage and and whatnot, I'll get to that and networking. Um, you know, so to actually have a service work, there's more than just the instance containers. Uh, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. Normally you'd have an operating system which just supports a num you know, have test drivers for, let's say, a number of different network cards or something. Like yeah. a standard image. And it's not clear that you can't just create a standard image that works, that has device drivers for the various virtualized NICs that you'd expect across your providers, right? And you just have one operating system image that works yeah. on, and yeah, this no. is just multiple pe sorts of PCs. So I think that with, with Linux containers and whatnot is similar to what you're talking about. And so you could just have, I mean, in some sense, the hypervisor is just an operating system anyways. This is a little bit lower level abstraction, so it makes a little bit less assumptions in some sense. You know, you're just abstracting that instruction set architecture as opposed to the ABI of the and system calls and whatnot, the operating system. But you could get that to work. But now, you know, going back to the buzzwords, that's a little bit higher level. Uh, so maybe more of a platform as a service, which you could get to work. And you could get that, you know, if I have a similar type of Linux OS and containers running on Amazon and Azure, uh, then I could migrate my processes between the two. Um, you know, historically, VM migration is a little bit easier than process migration, but if it's all in the same uh, container and abstraction, you should get that to work as well. And there's been SOSP papers recently that show that that actually is more efficient the more that you uh, assume. This actually is a bit heavyweight, but it's a little bit more transparent as well. So what's the cost? What's the what cost? The performance cost of this. 
Yeah, so the, the performance cost, so there's a Eurosys paper that talks about that in detail. And in general, the performance overhead for, if it's CPU bound, then you know, essentially nil, but a lot of the IO bound, uh, if it was networking uh, or storage for some of the benchmarks we ran was about five to 10%. In fact, that was the whole thing that took us some number of months was how do you actually you know, avoid uh, TLB flushes and avoid some other things that were making the performance 100x. So we started out, got it to work, it was 100x slower. <laughs> So then we got it down to 10x slower, 10%, and then 5% slower. So it is, it is some overhead, um, but for some of the gains, we, we think that you know, it would be a benefit for a lot of different applications. Did you have a question? Yeah, the question actually that was more about the performance. Oh, okay. but given <coughs> that I got the opportunity, and, I was, uh, and the second question was about, basically I was a bit confused about your uh, answer to the question about Docker containers. If you have Docker containers, why would you need Zen Blanket at all? No, I, so I guess the question is, you wouldn't necessarily need Zen Blanket if you had, you know, uh, containers like Docker and whatnot. You could just stay within the abstraction. Uh, this is uh, what I was saying is a little bit lower level abstraction. So now, instead of having to work with Linux containers or within Docker or whatnot, you're just given a raw machine image. You could put whatever OS you want on top of that, and then you can migrate that you know hole somewhere else so this is a little bit more coarse uh, in some sense than than that okay so let's go on a little bit uh, in terms of performance I won't talk too much more about the low level performance but you know if you have more questions we can uh, get into that I'll talk a little bit more uh, now about the applications so what this actually enables okay so the key here is that this is a picture just showing the Droste effect. So uh, Robert Vavronese is from the Netherlands, and this is some uh, candy, some sugar, some from the, the Netherlands, I guess. And this shows the Droste effect, which is uh, recursive. So you see this none in this picture as well. So this is an image of some type of recursion, okay? which is essentially what we have going on here. So with the super cloud then, is now that we control the second layer, we can start uh, OpenStack. So now we have our own cloud. We have our own infrastructure as a service. We don't own any of the underlying infrastructure, but we have some virtual infrastructure that we control. So we can now have uh, OpenStack that can control those second layer instances. We can have um, you know, SDN, so Open vSwitch, and we can control the network. And then we'll talk about storage as well. So the key now is that I, ha I can have my own uh, stack here in Amazon, and here in uh, HP Cloud, and here in Rackspace, and I can now uh, have an OpenStack control all of these red second layer instances. Okay, and I can then also have uh, Open vSwitch and my own SDN network, and I can move uh, uh, I can move an instance from one provider to another, and I can maintain its own the same internal IP address. We still have an uh, issue with external IP addresses, but as far as the internal topology of my super cloud, my own cloud, I can maintain all the, uh, the same exact topology as I move things around physically. Okay, and so this, uh, this actually is quite a bit more that I've added. So I have my own cloud that I can control now. So this is, gets to some of your issues, which is there's quite a bit more than just the virtual machine instance abstraction. There's also uh, how do you actually manage and maintain those, and there's also the network. Okay, and so, yes? I have a question. Um, why did you choose to use Zen server as your second layer hypervisor and not any other uh, hypervisor? Yeah, uh, I don't have a real good answer for that. Uh, it was open source. We could have done KVM. Uh, we're just a little bit more used to uh, Zen, but you could have had a KVM blanket. You could have a, you know, a Hyper-V blanket in some sense. Uh, we happen to choose Zen because we were more used to that uh, at the time. Um, you know, so it wasn't. I'll have to think about a much better answer than that in the future. But other than that, it was really just uh, that was the one that we were used to at the time. 
And so, uh, so we have Hyper-V uh, running, which means that we can now control the topology. Uh, we have our own virtual switch within a physical node, and we have you know, gateways between uh, that can create tunnels between different, uh, different clouds and whatnot. And so we can actually migrate and maintain connections between different uh, cloud providers, okay? Maintain the same network topology. We also have a storage abstraction where we have a abstraction of a globally consistent image store. So this is for images. And we have a NFS. Uh, uh, NFS is, that's right. So sometimes I confuse that with the National Science Foundation. The NFS, so network file system, and uh, iSCSI abstraction to this, this global store. And since all the I.O. goes through our second layer, domain zero, we can actually then uh, be, uh, migrate blocks proactively or reactively depending on where uh, image is and where it's migrated and whatnot. So this is, we've created this and uh, made it quite a bit more efficient than some of the more coarse ways that you may do this. So we have now storage, we have networking, we have a management layer on top of our own cloud. And what we don't have is any underlying infrastructure. Don't have a data center, you know, don't have to own any of the actual pi network pipes or any of the actual disks, you know, for that matter. So we have our own cloud, uh, but it's virtual, okay? So now, what does this buy you? I have my own virtual cloud. It works on top of multiple clouds. It's a super cloud, as we call it. Uh, so let's go through some of these examples that we talked about to begin with. Can we actually lower latency uh, to end clients? And so here's a map of uh, the world and a bunch of data centers from different cloud providers, Amazon and Rackspace and HP, uh, whatnot, that's all over the world. I don't have Azure on this because it doesn't work on top of Hyper-V yet. We're, we're working on that. Um, so hopefully we'll get that to work soon. And so the key here is that uh, if you're here in England um, and then you move to you know, Ireland or whatnot, then Rackspace doesn't have a, uh, a data center in Ireland, but Amazon does. And so uh, if I move to Ireland, then I can actually have a lower latency, you know, if I can actually move my service from one provider to, uh, to another. Okay, so this actually shows that. This shows on the x-axis uh, different clients. So I have clients in Washington in the US or UC uh, San Diego in the US. Over here is Hong Kong and China and whatnot. Uh, this is the UK right there. So I have clients all over the world. This is Planet Lab. And then I'm going to essentially going to find the, uh, the lowest latency to a data center within a provider. So these bars right here are the lowest latency from this Washington DC node to a data center within Rackspace. Okay, so the lowest latency is uh, about 50 milliseconds. Okay, and, and Massachusetts is a little bit lower, so they must have a data center close to uh, Boston or whatnot. And in Amazon, I can plot the same thing. So there's actually a data center within or close to DC in Virginia and whatnot, and so it's a lower latency uh, from this Washington node to the closest uh, data center within Amazon, okay? And then these are the same things uh, all over uh, the world. And then we have here HP. And so this is the lowest uh, latency to an HP uh, data center. And so the, then the, the key takeaway from here is that now if I have the super cloud, I can match that lowest latency uh, to a data center from any one of these clients. So, for example, I have here that within, um, I think that's UNC, so North Carolina. So SuperCloud matches the Amazon latency, which is the lowest, uh, from that Planet Lab node uh, to the closest data center of any one of these three. Okay? And so I'm thinking that HP is never the right number. <laughs> HP, yes. So HP doesn't have enough data centers for... Yes, you're right. Uh, I don't... Yeah. Except for in Hong Kong. So if you're in Hong Kong, then HP is the right answer. No, HP is green. 
Oh, right. I was looking at Rackspace. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're right. That would be maybe the closest. So HP is, and the map earlier does not have that many data centers. Uh, so performance uh, would not be the reason that you would go to HP. But in any case, here in China, then, Racks, then the super cloud matches Rackspace with the lowest latency. OK? Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, so there, we are, we do have a second layer, so there is some overhead. So within that standard deviation, but that, that mean is a little bit higher. I see, but it's, it's not very prevalent in all the other columns, but there it is. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure exactly why, except, except uh, just that the, you know, the second layer has some performance consequence. Okay, so that's one example. Another example we call follow the sun. So follow the sun, you have some replicated. Uh, so with the follow the sun, that just means that as the sun moves, people wake up and they start using cloud services. And so the load increases wherever the sun is. OK? And so the, the service now that I'm going to assume is ZooKeeper. So within ZooKeeper, it maintains consistency over uh, replication, some replicated service. So in the way you do that, it essentially, you're going to have a uh, majority of your maintainer quorum. And so uh, with ZooKeeper, then, you would write in this example to at least two out of the three for a write. And perhaps you would read from two out of the three as well, uh, just to make sure that there is some intersection with the most recent update. OK? And then you're also going to order the updates with some master node. Uh, and so this is just a very, very high level of ZooKeeper. And so the key now is uh, if all of my clients are in the US, then their performance um, that they're going to receive from the ZooKeeper service is going to be pretty good. There's a quorum, majority of uh, the replicas within the US. So the latency is going to be quite low. But as the, the day goes on and the people in the US go to sleep and people in Asia wake up, if the majority stays in the US, the majority of replicas for the ZooKeeper, then the clients in Asia are going to have a very bad performance. You know, it's going to be a very high latency to, uh, to write or read to a quorum. Okay? And so what uh, you would like to do using a super cloud is you would like to migrate that master to where most of the load is. Okay? So we can follow the sun. We can migrate to where that high load is. And notice also I migrated from here it was Amazon and here it's uh, Rackspace. So I migrated that master to uh, not only a different part of the world, but a different provider entirely. And I did so transparently without changing anything about ZooKeeper. So as far as ZooKeeper is concerned, nothing changed. But as far as the clients are concerned, the performance is a whole lot better. OK? And so we did that. And this graph here shows the example where we didn't migrate the master. The x-axis shows, uh, this is a CDF. So the x actually shows the, uh, the latency for a read in black and a uh, write in red for the US clients. And there's blue and green here for the Asian clients. And this is log scale. So it was just a couple of milliseconds to read and write for our US clients. And it was you know, well over 100 milliseconds to read and write for uh, the Asian clients. This is when the quorum was in the US. Okay? If I now do the migration using a super cloud like I just showed you, then now uh, for our Asian and, uh, and US clients, you know, the, there was actually a shift. So when we ran this experiment, <laughs> there was a shift in load uh, based on the time and day. Then 80%, you know, the clients actually receive very good performance, uh, just a few milliseconds. And then if you happen to read or write while the quorum was on the other side of the planet, then about 20% or so received, uh, you know, very low or very high latency. So this then shows that we're able to follow the sun very transparently. We're able to maintain a high performance. And we're able to do so utilizing multiple clouds. So this just shows uh, one of the benefits of using uh, multiple clouds. Okay? Now what about costs? So 
one of the whole reasons that you'd move to the cloud to begin with is cost. You know, you don't want to maintain your own clouds. Perhaps you can, you only buy what you need. So the a la carte, you know, is advantageous for you. Um, Amazon has created what they call the spot market. So the spot market is nice because uh, if you have underutilized resources, they'll actually price uh, those instances, spot instances, fairly cheaply. Okay. Now the consequence, though, is that uh, the price can actually go high. Often, if load increases in that area, if they want to move people out of that area, each availability zone will have their own spot market. They also can terminate your instance at any time. So for that reason, um, you know, prices can jump real high, and you can maintain a maximum price uh, bid or whatnot. And also, for the most part, your job should be stateless since you could be terminated at any time. There is a warning, but it's only a couple minute warning that you'd be terminated. Okay, so this is uh, only useful for a um, you know, certain set of tasks or uh, whatnot. And so if I now use a super cloud, what I can do is I can take that warning, I can migrate before being terminated so I can maintain higher availability. And I can also migrate to the cheapest market. Okay, so each hour I can evaluate, I can look at all the availability zones, and I can migrate to the cheapest one. And if there's none that are cheap, I can then migrate to a regular instance. That's always there, it's always available. So I can maintain a much higher availability service uh, using this, and I can maintain it at the cheapest price. Okay, so those are some of the benefits there. And so this then shows a couple examples of what I was talking about. This is a week long. Uh, trace of prices. The yellow here are regular on-demand instances and they're always the same price. Uh, in this example, 35 <laughs> cents uh, an hour. And then we have different availability zones here. And then you can see here that often they're fairly cheap. Um, you know, a couple cents uh, per hour. But every once in a while they can actually jump uh, in price significantly. So this is a couple dollars per hour. And that's essentially they want you off that uh, spot instance in that availability zone. And so with the black here with the spot with the super cloud or the uh, smart spot market, we can always uh, maintain the lowest price possible. And if there's no single uh, market with a low price, like over here, then we can jump to a regular instance. Okay. So in this case, we're always maintaining the lowest price. And then over this week, uh, this black here shows the total amount of money we spent over the week. And compared to one availability zone, this, uh, what is this, this uh, US East availability zone, 1E, is many factors cheaper than that. And if you are lucky enough to be on this 1A, then it's a couple times cheaper than that. But the key here is that SuperCloud is always the cheapest and often uh, many factors, many multiple times cheaper than any other option. And uh, you get that almost for free. Okay? Uh, we're looking at this a little bit more. So if you're actually to migrate between different providers, there's costs that you have to take into consideration uh, whether it's actually advantageous to migrate or not. We've looked at that a little bit more. and it turns out um, uh, most of the time you would end up not uh, migrating to some other provider. And so we're starting to look at different games uh, to where it would actually make sense to migrate to different providers or not. But at least within Amazon, you can migrate to different availability zones um, and maintain a lower price. So all of this is kind of predicated on the assumption that uh, you have a small number of very precious VMs that you want to be able to move to wherever the, the use arbitrage to, to move to wherever it's cheapest to currently run those VMs, right? Yeah. So small number, precious, long running. Is that realistic? I mean, any large provider, take, you know, you use net, uh, what's called Netflix at one point as your example, right? But I mean, Netflix is going to have, has, in fact, an Azure optimized service that runs on Azure plus an Amazon optimized service that runs on Amazon, right? And the way they 
do their arbitrage is by choosing how many instances they spin up in different places and adjust by their load as well, right? They don't want to pay a 5% overhead to be able to move one of their instances between Azure and Amazon. Right. Uh, so uh, I guess yes, no. So you have to, so they did some calculus and they, they have optimized instances, like you said, in both providers. But, you know, how much state, if any, you would actually need to migrate. One thing about um, uh, Netflix is, you know, their state doesn't actually change that often. You know, once they encode a video into 100 different formats or whatnot, it pretty much stays there. Um, if you have something that is a little bit more dynamic, if, you know, is it worth it to actually migrate your 2 to 10 gigabyte VM somewhere else? And, you know, we actually are able to do the math fairly easily. Uh, you see the cost for that new hour. You see the cost to actually migrate. Would that be cheaper at all? Um, for, you know, like you said, just some small number of instances. If I had a much larger ensemble, and we're starting to look at this now, I don't have any results here, then the calculus is a little bit different. Um, you know, if I had, you know, hundreds of machines and I want to maintain the lowest price and best performance possible for that uh, ensemble, then what strategy makes the most sense? So I guess the key here is this is a mechanism and you can now start to play with, with strategy. And I haven't really said anything about strategy except the most simplest thing possible. Hitesh, did you have a question? Okay, so, so this is, we would say, an enabler. And uh, you know, we would like to start to look at strategy and games uh, more in depth. But you can save money. Uh, so we also talked, I won't go too much into this, but uh, you can also burst from a private cloud to public cloud pretty easily and maintain all the same network connections and whatnot. There's also service, other services for this as well. But going a little bit more to what you're saying, uh, if you have the you know, CloudWatch or some of these other services, you can um, add and remove instances based on load. Uh, one of the things... Um, about the super cloud is you actually can uh, maintain the same number of instances, but add or remove, let me say that again, you can maintain the same number of second layer instances, but you can add or remove first layer instances based on load. So now I don't actually have to change my service at all, uh, but I can actually adjust my cost. Um, and I can do so automatically. And so what this shows then is I have um, three first layer instances and I have three second layer instances. Um, and the load is high. And when the load is low, I now migrate so that I have one first layer instance and I have three second layer instances. So my service hasn't changed at all, but the underlying number of physical machines, if you will, has changed. And so as a result, my cost to maintaining that service has changed. But I didn't have to change the, the service at all. And so, this, so designing for this, we argue then, is a little bit easier than using something like CloudWatch or whatnot that would actually increase and decrease uh, the number of servers that you would have. OK, and so this then shows uh, right here, if I had three uh, first layer instances all the time, um, and this is some type of web traffic, then as the web traffic increases, uh, I'm able to handle that, but here, you know, I'm wasting a lot of money because I didn't need three instances. And here, if I had one instance that entire time, then I wouldn't be able to handle all the load uh, that the, the service uh, would need to handle. And then down here, the blue line is the second number of second layer instances, and the black is the number of requests. I'm able to dynamically scale the number of first layer instances so that I can handle uh, the requests and I can scale that up and down. Okay? And so this then, uh, you know, the super cloud enables that because I'm able to migrate those second layer instances to essentially uh, use one underlying physical machine and then I can spread that out uh, as necessary. You also have a choice of scaling up, right? You can always decide whether to get a larger VM or get a 
medium sized VM or small VM. So how do you make that? Have you, have you yeah, that? so again, this is the mechanism. We're starting to look at you know, when and how would you go to a larger VM. Um, we, we have started to look at that you know, because it is a little bit cheaper, economical to have a larger VM with more, a larger underlying VM with more second layer instances packed within those. Uh, but uh, I don't have, you know, this is policy and strategy and I don't have anything uh, concrete to say about that this time. But that's a very good question. Okay, so but this is, you know, another thing that is enabled though is to start to play with those strategies. So in any case, the key here is that with the super cloud, we can now maintain our own cloud. It's our own infrastructure as service. Some of the things that we've been doing recently is looking at demonstration cases and examples to actually uh, work across different clouds um, and play with those examples. We're starting now to then do the next thing, which is uh, some of the strategies where that actually makes sense. So some of the scheduling and placement and strategies. Uh, we're working now to get this on Hyper-V. This says that VMware, so we actually just recently got to work on VMware a couple weeks ago. Uh, and now we're, we're working on getting it to work on Hyper-V. And we're also starting to look at some of the security implications uh, as well. And so the, the key here then is that there are some number of papers that have led up to where we are now starting um, really almost in 2010. There was a storage paper that I wrote, uh, RACS, which is a re redundant array of cloud storage, essentially RAID right over the cloud. Um, the entire agenda here is trying to prevent vendor lock-in to allow you to utilize multiple different cloud providers interchangeably and to make them more into a commodity, really, um, and to do so today. So if there's a standard that comes about, that'd be great. But as of right now, everything that I just showed you works today, and there's no agreed upon standard. Okay, and then there's some other work, and the code actually is available, so you could download it and uh, play with it. We've had um, a class do that, and we've also had some undergrads over the summer do that as well, so kind of guinea pig and uh, you know, uh, test things out for us. Okay, so if you have any other questions, you can feel free to e email me and uh, follow up. I'll be here for another six months or so. Yes. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> what I would like, though, so you know, as as a professor, what what I would like ideally is a student to do that, yeah. and then I kind of write their their coattails. So do I want to actually spend the time, it's a significant amount of time and effort if anybody's ever done that. My brother's done that. I started out with him, I'll tell you a quick story. I was a PhD student, I was married and had a son. And we started this company together. And then we had this heart to heart conversation. He was saying that you can't do half of this and half of that, you can't half ass it. So he said, either you're in or you're out. So I said, let me go talk to my wife. So I talked to her and I said, do you want to leave Berkeley and go up to Portland and leave, live in my brother's garage you know, until we can get this thing up and going? <laughs> she just about knocked me to the ground. <laughs> no way. So I, told, so I ca called him back and said that, you know, that I'm out. So I would like to be able to do that, um, but you, know, you have to be fairly serious about it. So as of right now, everything that we've done you know, is open source. So there have been some Ravello or I think whatnot, some similar type of companies, uh, but I think that is still, you know, open game that, you know, something like this could be commercialized. And I, I am interested, um, but I haven't, you know, I haven't committed in that direction. Yeah, I mean, what you're doing, I think it's, it's, it's technically convincing, but I think it's fairly simple until the cloud providers, until you have so many users and you commercialize this and the cloud providers decide whether they, they, they do something to keep the lock-in, right? Once it becomes kind of a, a cat and mouse game where the cloud providers make it more difficult for you to, to do well, what you're doing, then... Yeah, I mean, in some sense, they already are because, you know, a lot of them have, like, a Hadoop service or whatnot. So if that's what you're doing, then that could actually already lock you into providers. So there, there's already, today, there's a lot of feature, and then you need to somehow, you know, as, as a user, not, you know, take advantage of those or somehow 
code that into your, your service. Um, so, is, you know, right now they're not worried about us at all. Uh, and I've, I've given a talk at Amazon. Say that again. So is there something that they could do to make your job harder? Uh, to make it harder? To uh, make it harder to build the super cloud, to, like, to, to increase the overhead. Like if, they, if they change what they're doing in some way, your yeah, overhead... I mean, I suppose. Work. So I mean, we're, we do have some trouble. So I don't know if they're explicitly making it harder for us. But implicitly, they make it harder. So the, we're having a little bit of trouble with the Google Compute Engine. It uses KVM, but I think that it may actually run within the, inside their containers. And so um, you know, we're having trouble there. They didn't do that because of us. You know, their infrastructure was already running that way. Um, so there, there's some things implicitly that already make it hard. Um, if we were, or something like this was very successful, how would they react? I don't know. Am so I've given a talk at Amazon. They actually seem very excited about it. They're you know, a high volume dealer. They think that this would actually drive more people to utilize uh, the cloud. So if it could reduce the barrier. <laughs> yeah. Not extremely opposite. Is there any standardization efforts so that I could migrate my VM from one cloud to the other without using the super cloud? There, there are some standardization efforts. I gave a talk in July at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, but you know, there, you know, what is the motivation for some of these companies to take up those standards? So they're they're developing them storage-wise. You know, there's a lot of different uh, storage um, standards that exist and whatnot. Um, and if you, if you look at uh, you know, Azure and uh, Google and Amazon, they actually are compliant with a lot of those, those standards. But still to have a service then be able to run you know, from one place to another um, is still non-trivial. Because storage is one part about it, just like we talked about. Networking, so how do you actually get the entire thing uh, to work from one cloud to another? That's non-trivial. How expensive is it to move your data between these providers and have like allocations for storage? Yeah. Um, so you can calculate um, at least the one-time cost of moving. You know, it's uh, your VM and the working set of data that is touching, uh, and whatever the cost is to, you know, bytes per second or whatnot, into uh, into another provider. Can you give some intuition as to like how? For what type, like what size of workloads, like data sets, this might make sense, like with the range versus where it just usually becomes prohibitive? So, with the spot market that we've done, we, we got a little bit further with that. And so, for most of those cases, it was not actually advantageous to, uh, to migrate to another provider. So, with like a two gigabyte VM and a slight change in price, um, it actually was uh, cheaper to stay within the same availability zone or same, uh, same provider than migrate to another one. It was too expensive for most of those cases. That's for a single VM. Now, when you start to look at an ensemble of VMs and how they communicate and whatnot, then it may be different. But for a single VM case, uh, it turned out that it was not advantageous for a lot of cases to migrate between different providers. You could have an asymmetric solution where you don't virtu uh, double virtualize on Xen. So you run native on Xen and you add the extra layer to port Xen to other platforms. Uh, what, what's the trade-off or why do you actually need uh, double virtualization? Even yeah, on so I didn't actually understand everything. So I'll ask you to say it one more time and then I'll have so to take it off. You could uh, do the same except that you do not double virtualize when running on Xen. You just run on top of Xen without the added second layer of uh, Xen, Xen blanket. And then on the other machines you do, uh, on the cloud you do as before. So, yeah, so, so can you save the cost of uh, the double virtualization on, on Xen machines? So are you saying that in some cases you don't do the nested virtualization? Yes. And in some cases, so uh, if I understood you correctly then, uh, if you're in your own private cloud, you actually don't need the nested virtualization at all. Yes. If you're in, um, you know, if you're in a public cloud, it's hard to have that control that you need without having that control of the hypervisor. Uh, so in that case, that kind of forces you into having nested virtualization, unless they give you some hooks. So someone earlier asked, 
you know, what could they do to thwart things? Well, they could do something else to enable. You know, they could actually give you some hooks into people are talking that, about that with networking. So hooks within the network. Uh, they could give you uh, hooks so that you could control more and don't need to do nested virtualization. And you know, you could do migration already, for example, within Rackspace. Okay, good. So it's pretty neat that you've been able to do this for VMs and networking. And the advantage there you had was that the API is fixed, right? For the VM, you're providing an x86 interface. For networking, uh, OpenFlow helps you. <coughs> for storage, it's harder because there is no agreed upon API. For other things, other services like appliances, middle boxes, it's even harder. And so this is a statement you said a couple of days, a couple of hours or a couple of minutes ago that doing it for the entire stack is going to be tricky. Because how do you expect to offer the same API across all the services that cloud providers are going to offer? Because you know, as in Azure or EC2, they don't want to be stuck into the sort of infrastructure yeah. of the service business. They'll probably be offering more services. I don't know if I expect to offer the same API for all the services that all the providers may may have. Um, you know, the issue. So, for example, with Hadoop, you could use Amazon's Hadoop. Uh, which may have slightly different API, or you could download your own Hadoop and run it within your own ensemble set of instances, and then that gives you more control, and then you could you know, run Hadoop in different underlying providers. But if you use, um, uh, if you use some service from that underlying provider, then you know, if provider A gives you that service and provider B doesn't, then you have to either replicate that service or you could only utilize that service in cloud A. And so, you know, this, these are real issues, and we haven't pretended to solve those, but the more features you start to use, the more locked in you would be. I guess what I'm arguing is that it's actually beyond mechanism and policy, because then I guess what I'm questioning is, you will lose the battle because the service providers will, if I use the special Hadoop that uses this fancy feature on Amazon, it will improve my performance. I get vendor lock-in. And Amazon will do that, and Azure will do that, because we want our customers to be yeah. tied in. So, so one of the things we've been doing for that exact question is um, you know, what type of applications would work across different cloud providers that make sense? And you know, in some sense, looking for trying to create the killer app where this makes sense. But if you do uh, you know, like uh, what Netflix does, and you're conditioned for Azure, and you're conditioned for uh, for Amazon, then you know you're going to get much better performance. But not everybody has you know as many engineers as <laughs> Netflix does, for example. So the key is you know it is kind of a, a trade-off. Uh, we are looking for and creating different applications and demonstration cases. Okay, maybe any last question? Okay, good.